the line at this point. We're getting a little bit behind here on the schedule, but um, glad to see that we have such a great crowd. Uh, before we get started, I just want to, a little bit of housekeeping. We are filming this, and if uh, we have a phone, just put a picture of a library or silent, if you're able to do that. Uh, restrooms, as soon as you come in the front door, to the left, so if anyone needs to use the restroom. There's plenty of food, drinks, so feel free to go have seconds, so that way it's less that I have to pack up and take with me. Um, recognizing any dignitaries that we have here today, we do have Speaker uh, Joe Byrne, former Chief of the Cherokee Nation as well, so I want to recognize him and the open with prayer, so I want to thank him for that. And another thing, I want to recognize all of our veterans. So if you are a veteran, please stand up and let us recognize you for your service. So 
their, what they were doing is very important. Their lives were at stake. So several years later, in 2008, uh, the U.S. Congress passed a public law that actually put a definition on who the co-talkers were for recognition. Uh, for, for, the, for the legal definition of a co-talker, uh, it's, it's a Native American who served in the armed forces during a foreign conflict in which the United States was involved, and someone who transmitted, transmitted secret coded messages for tactical usage in the World War I and World War II. And it says non-spontaneous communication, which means uh, there were a lot of uh, natives in the military and they spoke their language, but that doesn't necessarily mean they were using it as code talkers. They could have been talking to each other just in, as an everyday conversation. That's why it says non-spontaneous, which means they used it for a specific purpose of this tactical uh, messaging. So for a little bit of context, uh, when you think about World War I, it started in 1914. Uh, that wasn't very long after what happened to the, uh, uh, the five tribes, the other tribes in Indian Territory. Uh, in 1901, an act of Congress uh, basically said they were going to uh, abolish the tribal governments in Indian Territory. They were paving the way for to start the state of Oklahoma. As part of that, they actually, for example, they uh, dismantled our newspaper, uh, the Turkey Advocate. Uh, they were going to abolish the tribal government, and they also bestowed the citizenship on the Cherokees that were in Oklahoma. Uh, in 1905, there was a move to make the state of Sequoia, which was, would have been an Indian state, that didn't happen, and instead we have the state of Oklahoma. Uh, so in the five tribes back in 1906, that kind of put it all in place, uh, which kind of gave rise to the concept of Chief for a Day, where we lost a lot of our powers in that tribal government. Uh, and then in 1907, Oklahoma was a state. So this is, this is the context, this is the role in which the uh, natives who were enlisting in the military were living, at least from Oklahoma. It was kind of a very tough situation to be in. Uh, according to the uh, U.S. Army, uh, there were quite a number of uh, tribes that were uh, used, I guess, were enlisted in the world. Uh, this is from their website. Uh, it's focusing on the 142nd Infantry Regiment, 36th Division. Uh, they had uh, Indians who spoke 26 different languages, so imagine there's quite a lot of different languages that were actually involved in the military. So I'm going to kind of get some focus here on who, who could have possibly been co talkers in the World War I for who were uh, the 142nd Infantry, the 36th Division, Company E, uh, they were stationed at Camp Bowie in uh, Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, this company were, uh, it was primarily an Indian company. Uh, most of them were uh, very well educated. Uh, they were bilingual. If you weren't, if you did not speak English well enough, they discharged you from the service at that time. So most of these Indians that were serving uh, had a, a grasp of English well enough to actually serve in the military. Uh, a lot of them were educated in college and universities. Uh, some went to the Carlisle Indian School in Haskell as well. Uh, at the time, uh, the Commissioner of Indian Affairs, Mr. Cato Sells, went to visit the camp down there with the C Company E. And, uh, at this history, at this point too, uh, there's a lot of segregation going on with the, uh, uh, for example, uh, African Americans that were segregated from the rest of the military as well, had their own uh, companies and divisions. Uh, so they wanted to do the same, with, in terms of being a native person, they didn't want to follow that same policy. They wanted to integrate the natives in with everyone else. So he decreed that all the uh, natives would be uh, as he says here, mixed indiscriminately among the whites, elbow to elbow, so they will absorb the English habits and civilizations of their white brothers. So the, the concept was to try to get these and these more white. Uh, that didn't really happen. Uh, company E became one of the mainly mostly Indian company in the uh, military at the time, in World War I. Uh, a lot of these tribes in Company E were from oil rich tribes. <coughs> An example is Lord Mitchell, who was a Pawnee. Uh, he received a $6,000 royalty check. 
Um, because of this, a lot of the other members of the company received checks like this too, and they called, they got the name the Millionaire Company. <laughs> so, uh, there's an article in the Daily Oklahoma newspaper from 1917 which listed, it, they tried to list all the tribes in Oklahoma that were enlisted in the, uh, the war effort. Uh, they were specifically listed 68 Cherokees from Oklahoma were in it. Uh, one of them was George A. Dare here, but another one that was kind of might be of interest to some of you is that Stokes Smith was actually one of them as well. But uh, George A. Dare, uh, in the Emmett Starr's book, History of Cherokee Indians, uh, he's actually identified as a Cherokee co-talker. This is one of the, the rare uh, instances of an actual documented source that's been written down as someone serving as a co-talker. Uh, there are a lot of family stories of people who are cook doctors. Uh, that doesn't mean that they weren't, but as far as actual official documentation, this is one of the rare times that you see that. Uh, and as the quote from the book says, uh, he was taken from the firing line, uh, and he was placed with other full blood churches in the telephone service. And the telephone services, which were mostly the cook talking occurred, they would actually run the lines across the ground and talk to each other on the telephone. Uh, so they foiled the German listeners in by repeating and receiving and transmitting the military orders in the Cherokee language. George A. there, uh, after the war, or before the war, while he was from Nawada, and this is a photograph, one of the only known photographs of him, it's kind of fuzzy to make out, but he made his home in the Nawada area uh, prior to the war. Uh, this is his. Uh, a service card uh, from that time. He's the National Guard. After the war, uh, George A. Dare served on the school board for the Nevada schools. Uh, he was killed in a car crash, unfortunately, in 1947. And what I find interesting about him is on his tombstone, he's listed as a cook. <laughs> uh, when you uh, look at the co-talkers, most of their activity, like I mentioned earlier, was classified for decades. A lot of people, you know, at least the official channels, they wouldn't even speak about this. There were very few things written down about what was going on. There were only a few formalized uh, co-talking programs, like the Choctaws of World War, and had an actual documented military program on the books. Uh, the Cherokees do not, but that doesn't mean that they weren't used in that capacity. They had informal notebooks in which they would use codes and pass them along. Uh, a lot of the co-talkers that were Cherokee were actually Eastern Band, too. And Dr. King will touch on a lot of this in his talk as well. But this is a picture from the uh, South Carolina Historical Society archive which shows some of the Eastern Band uh, Cherokees in their uniform getting ready to go off to the war. There's a document in the Fort Benning, Georgia archives uh, from a man named uh, Captain uh, John W. Stanley. And he uh, wrote a report after the war about how he used uh, Cherokees uh, in World War I to actually transmit their uh, messages. Uh, this picture is taken from that document. It shows some of the, uh, the diagrams that they drew to to connect all the phone lines when they were using this, you know, the church as co-talkers. Uh, they fought in Somme, the Somme area, which is uh, north of Paris in France. Uh, the Somme Offensive was a very major uh, military battle in World War I. There were several battles there. There were some of the most bloodiest fighting ever. So when you think about the co-talkers actually being used in battle, these, these battles were huge. One of the battles there on the first day of fighting, over 67,000 people were killed. So you can imagine how important that their work was to keep people alive. Uh, this is just a map showing where they were kind of fighting at, at this time. Uh, you can see the little mark at the top, that's where the, the Song River is, and that's kind of the area where a lot of this fighting was going on. Uh, in World War I, the United States entered kind of late. Uh, they didn't really get involved with 1917. It was in 1918 when most of the co-talkers that were church saw battle. 
This is another excerpt from the report from Captain Stanley, and uh, I like what he says here about uh, Cherokees, and he's talking about specifically here some Eastern Maine Cherokees from North Carolina. He says, uh, they contained quite a number of Cherokee Indians which were now somewhere in the vision, and that, in my opinion, of the, a number of the most intelligent of them were placed at each telephone, that they transmit all messages in their native tongue. I felt sure that even a battalion commander could use them in transmitting messages to his company, commanders in perfect safety. So he, he realized the importance of using uh, Cherokees in this capacity and the importance of the language. Uh, another excerpt from this document. Uh, as part of the fighting, they captured a German soldier and they, they as part of the interrogation process, uh, the German is reported to ask this question. He says, that, gentlemen, we have officers in our army that can speak and translate the majority of the language of the world. None of them can understand the language you Americans are using over the telephone. Now, please, gentlemen, won't you tell me what it is? And it says there's quite a bit of laughter because no one told him what they were saying. <laughs> I, I really like that particular quote because it does, again, it shows how, uh, I guess, it astounded the uh, Germans or the Alpha Europe were about what this language they were hearing. And this would have been a common occurrence, not just for the Cherokee language, but other languages, too. And one final excerpt from his uh, report. Uh, he lists several things, lessons that he felt like he learned from using the Cherokees in this capacity. Uh, I like the second one here says the successful use of Cherokee Indians in transmitting messages over telephone and native tongue. And his third point is if I ever have the honor to command troops in battle again, if any American Indians are available, I will in all probability insist upon the use of the telephone. Again, he's just reinforcing the importance of, of you know, the tactical advantage that we had in that particular sense of using the language for combat. Uh, the Code Talkers in World War One, uh, it was quite a mystery to, again, a lot of the Europeans. Uh, they had, like I said, the Comanches were used, the, the Choctaws were used. There's a lot of different tribes that were all used in this capacity. So it was because of that, uh, after the war, uh, they started, Germans and Japanese in particular started sending spies to the United States to uh, see if they could learn more about native languages in the country. Uh, some of them were, came uh, acting like our students, some were anthropologists. Some came as uh, historians, but they were here for the purpose of actually uh, trying to find out what was going on there with the language. Uh, there are uh, documents showing that uh, a lot of foreign diplomats were buying publications from things at the Bureau of Ethnology to see what these languages were. Uh, some Japanese uh, even got employment at the BIA so they could learn more about the, the languages. <laughs> And there are lots of records showing that a lot of these people were arrested for their spying activities in the country. Uh, I think it's kind of, it's really interesting to think about uh, how confounded everyone was about what these languages were they were hearing. So much so that they put a lot of resources into trying to figure it out, trying to learn it. Uh, a lot of the, uh, at least in terms of the military side of it, uh, they focused mainly on languages that didn't have a formal written form. And as you all know, Cherokee has a silver. And so that's one reason why uh, there's a lack of formal documentation for Cherokee code talkers. Uh, and part of that reason is that the military didn't want to formalize the Cherokee part of it as an actual formal program in the military like they did the Choctaw for example. The Choctaws have actual documents written down showing uh, the training methods, the uh, code books, and that kind of thing. Uh, but that doesn't mean that they, uh, Cherokees weren't used in battle, it's just that they didn't have this formalized program as much as the others. Uh, but having said that, there may be quite a lot of information out there that's not been uncovered. Because uh, it's only been in recent years that all this information has been declassified. Uh, so there's a lot more research left out there to do. Uh, I think it would be great if we could, uh, as a community, see if we could find more stories about co-talkers that were in our families. 
Uh, like I said, right now, uh, George Ader, at least in terms of uh, down the Cherokee Nation side of the here in Oklahoma, he's the only one that's been documented. But even prior to this uh, talk, speaking with Speaker Byrd, he mentioned a co-doctor in his family. So there's, there's going to be people in your families that were more than likely were in this capacity. We just need to more, have a lot more stories about who they were. And if you could document that, that'd be great. Because it's a really good part of history. And uh, it's good to know that Cherokee's participate in that uh, capacity. So after decades of uh, really just kind of silence on it, uh, the Cherokees were recognized in 2013 uh, with this medal uh, for their work as co-doctors. And that the medal itself is here in the lobby. If you go out through the main doors here to the right, you can see the whole case there. Uh, this is the uh, picture of the front and back of the metal. And in Cherokee, it says, Uni Nathalia, Uni Uni Isti, which I guess would roughly say that they're changing what they're saying or something like that. So I was talking about this idea of encoding the language, they're changing or changing what, what they're saying to each other. And a lot of this research is, uh, like I mentioned earlier, it's a bit still kind of new in the sense that a lot of things are just now coming out about it. Now, here's a few uh, sources that I came across while I was doing this research. Uh, one really viable piece of uh, writing is the one at the bottom, the story of 36, uh, the experience of the 36th Division of World War by Captain Chastain. Uh, he had, that's where those photos we saw earlier of the uh, Indians at Camp Bowie and the training came from that book, and he has a lot of information about just the day to day lives and what they're doing there. As well as working with the combat outlaws, living with the, uh, <clears throat> or actually working with the uh, other Indians in the uh, division. So, with that, I think I will turn it over to Dr. King. Thank you, Cherokee is much more 
complex and foolish. And because of the various combinations of units and meanings that can be assembled to create a Cherokee verb, Cherokee is an ideal language for a military code. In addition to 60 sets of pronominal prefixes, there are also uh, aspect suffixes, uh, modal suffixes, and altogether, counting all the various combinations of pre uh, prefixes, uh, reflexive prefixes, and the various uh, suffixes, I counted 21,262 possible forms for each regular charity verb. All right, so if you just took a thousand uh, the most common Cherokee verbs and multiply them by all the possible forms, you would come up with over 21 billion words in the Cherokee language, and that's not, and there are more than that. By comparison, English has no more than 750,000 words uh, in the language, and 20% of those, and these are listed uh, in the dictionary, are no longer in use. Shakespeare, at the time, he was writing, if you take all of his collected, collected works, he only used 31,534 words in everything he wrote. And um, he probably gave twice that many, but still only about 66,000 words in the vocabulary of William Shakespeare. The average English speaker today, I understand, knows between 10 and 20,000 words. I'm not sure I could give you 10,000 words, so I'd probably fall below the, the average on that. But uh, nonetheless, I, I point this out just to uh, emphasize how uh, useful Cherokee uh, might be as a code language for the military. The morphophonetic rules, the, these are the rules that govern what the surface form of the verb is when you put the various units of meaning together are so complex that it would be extremely difficult for any non-native speaker to master the language. Uh, so in spite of the fact that Germans, uh, especially Germans more so than Japanese, did send scholars to the United States and Canada uh, in advance forward to, uh, to study American Indian languages. Uh, I don't think there was a single German, uh, and there weren't that many for Cherokee, uh, who could have deciphered or who could have decoded Cherokee uh, if they heard it on the radio or telephone. One of the people that I became acquainted with while working on the Cherokee language was the father of two of the young men that I had supervised uh, at, at the archaeological investigation at Shoda, which was the capital of the Cherokee Nation between 1753 and 1788. His name was Charles Edwin Crow. And this is uh, him in World War II. In the early 1970s, he was middle-aged. Uh, he was in his late 40s. He was a giant of a man. He was about 6'4 uh, and uh, had the build of a professional football player. And I'm sure we could have played wide receiver on any pro team heading uh, given the chance. But, uh, and this is uh, the same individual in the 1990s uh, later in life. Uh, Charles Crow was especially helpful to me because he introduced me to native speakers in every single township of Colorado. And with his introductions, uh, my acceptance by community members was greatly facilitated. Uh, Charles Crow enlisted in the Navy on 13 August 1942, one month after he turned 17 years old. His older sister, Edith, signed his consent form because he wasn't old enough to enlist, uh, because neither of his parents were literate. He remained in the uh, Navy until the war's end, in spite of the fact that his combat wounds uh, were serious enough to qualify him for discharge and conspicuous enough to earn him the nickname that stayed with him for the rest of his life, 
Scarf. He was released from the Navy on the 2nd of January 1946 and hurried home back to see his uh, parents, only to learn that his mother died while he was at sea. His children remembered him as being on the USS Louisville, a Northampton class heavy cruiser. Its displacement was 13,000 tons, loaded was 600 feet from length. Uh, I had a draft of 24 feet and a speed of 32 and a half knots. It had uh, uh, serious armaments uh, and three airplanes that were attached to the vessel. In the military records, and I went back and searched this records as well as other Eastern Territories. I also found the Charles E. Crow uh, listed at various times on the USS New Hanover and the USS McCracken, the latter being after a state of state of discharge, raising the question as to whether or not there's another person by the same name in the city the theater. Like most of the World War II vets I knew, uh, Scar did not talk about his war experiences very much. On occasion, he would talk about the attacks from kamikaze uh, planes near the Philippines. And on one occasion, he watched, and, and this is their uh, flotilla going into the, uh, the Gallian Gulf uh, when they were getting ready to, uh, for the invasion of Luzon. And these, the, uh, Louisville is their third ship in this line. It's the Pennsylvania, Colorado, Louisville, Port of Columbia. Uh, this was in January of uh, 1945. And the Louisville at that time was the flagship of the fleet. And uh, the Admiral uh, chose that ship. And, and I can't help but think the fact that there was a charity co-talker on the ship. Uh, that could communicate uh, with uh, other uh, 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 Cherokees in the fleet uh, probably was the reason uh, for choosing this ship. It wasn't the largest ship, but it was uh, uh, certainly a formidable uh, vessel. Um, on December 8, 1944, uh, Rear Admiral uh, Theodore uh, Chandler chose the Louisville as his flagship, and this was right before the invasion. But late in the afternoon on January 5th, the fleet was attacked by 16 kamikazes. And this is when they were about 100 miles uh, from Manila Bay. Uh, one of four successful kamikazes crashed into the uh, Louisville. And the, uh, and actually on two days, uh, one on January 5th, uh, which hit the, the second turret, and then uh, another kamikaze on January 6th. And this is uh, the impact of the it was a Mitsubishi 51 that crashed uh, direct hit by the bridge. Uh, Rear Admiral uh, Chandler was meant to burn in flaming gasoline was soaked in gasoline uh, called a fire, and he died uh, the following day, on um, January 7th. Uh, Scarborough was also wounded in this attack, and spent considerable time in the hospital in the Philippines. But this shows the fire damage in the second turret of the USS Lowell, and this shows uh, the impacts of both planes uh, when the, the ship was taken to dry dock for repair. Now, and this is uh, Rear Red uh, Chandler. Uh, when I first went to charity, the, the Crow family uh, had a house full of kids. They had uh, five kids of their own, three adopted uh, kids, and they walking sick, and as well as uh, foster children. Uh, All together, uh, Scar and his wife raised about 30 children. Uh, but he was only one of 335 Eastern Cherokees who participated in the war effort. 
I spoke to this man yesterday. Uh, his name is uh, Jerry Wolf. He works at the Museum of Charity India. He's now 88 years old. He still goes to work every day. And went home at lunch to, see, to grab this photograph of him in the service. And, uh, and brought it back to the museum. And one of his co-workers uh, scanned it and uh, sent it to me. From what I have. But anybody who's still working at 88 and driving it and, uh, and still very sharp mind uh, certainly has my respect and admiration. But uh, Jerry Wolf told me that he enlisted when he was 18 years old in order to avoid the draft. He also enlisted in, 19, he, he enlisted in 1943, spent six years in the Navy, and uh, in spite of the fact that he was a fluent Cherokee speaker, did not serve as a code talker. And I asked him about others who did. And he said, well, uh, one person who talked about it quite a bit was Elegance Katoster, Alexander E. Katoster, who was with Patton's Third Army uh, during the invasion of Europe. And, um, and from what I can tell, there, there were probably about uh, 40 uh, co-talkers, charity co-talkers in World War II, and most of them were accidental co-talkers. That is, they were not selected for that, but they ended up serving in that capacity when uh, another charity speaker was in the same unit. In the case of uh, Alex Katoster, there was another uh, Eastern Cherokee in the same company, and when the company was divided into platoons, he was put on one radio and uh, uh, the other guy was put on the other radio and they were able to communicate in Cherokee. The reason why Jerry Wolf, Jerry Wolf was at Jerry Patton in the D-Day invasion, that he was a member of a 16-man crew that manned a, a landing craft that unloaded tanks on the beach in Normandy when he was uh, 19 years old. But there were no other Cherokees in his unit. There was no one for him to talk to. But, uh, but there were Comanches. There were at least 14 Comanches that took part in the DA invasion. And they uh, were selected for that purpose. Uh, and I'll talk more about them in a minute. And I asked uh, Jerry if there were any code talkers still alive. And he identified this individual as a possible code talker. Uh, Reuben Taylor, I uh, wasn't, uh, was not sure uh, that he served in the capacity that could have, and, and I haven't had a chance to talk about it. But I do know that, at least in the Pacific, uh, Japanese cryptographers were trying to uh, decode uh, secret messages sent by uh, the Americans, and the uh, Imperial Navy and uh, a slew of cryptographers and people in the signal board, signal board that were listening to American transmissions. Now, when, uh, I, I talked to Scar about how the code operated, how it was used, and he said primarily they simply spoke in Cherokee, knowing that it would be difficult for him, uh, he wasn't a Cherokee speaker to understand it. But he said when they had to spell things out, they used an alphabetical code. And initially, this was a, uh, a single word for each letter in the English alphabet. So it was the Cherokee translation. And I should point out, I put this up for illustrative purposes, because in spite of the fact that he gave me the code in 1971, uh, he never wrote it down. I didn't write it down and tried to resurrect it 45 years later. I know I have some of the words right, but, uh, but not all. But, but one of the things they did as they, as they had to sell more things, they were very concerned that the Japanese would figure out that there were 26 letters in the English alphabet, unlike the Japanese alphabet, which has 52, and if they could identify 26 words, uh, and knew that they were spelling things, they would sooner or later be able to match up those words with the letters that they were spelling. 
So what they did to combat that was that they would use multiple words, but on the same principle. So for, uh, for example, uh, uh, letter L, uh, lightning, I'm not going to It could also be leech, it's on a new sheet in North Carolina, apply a new sheet, apply a new sleep in Oklahoma, or Tina, ice, or uh, leg or large, <coughs> large able, uh, could have been used for uh, L as well. What they avoided doing was using any words that had that started with the same sound that they were trying to convey. So, for example, they would not use wahya, wolf, or wahya for w, because wahya starts with the same sound of maturity that it does in English. Um, or squirrel, shalom, uh, they wouldn't use that because that also starts with S in Cherokee and S in English. So they didn't want to give the Japanese any more clues than necessary, but they did find it necessary to spell out words that either they had not defined yet, and a lot of the armaments they, uh, that they created Cherokee words for. Tank, for example, was Dakshi or Terrapin. Uh, G was Waloshi, or a frog, a toad frog. Uh, 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 and they had names for various airplanes, too. I'll, I'll talk about those in just a second. But they also tried to use minimal, uh, uh, even in, when they were spelling things out, even when they were uh, spelling something that had the same, same letters in one word, they would use different Cherokee words, uh, so it didn't provide another clue. Uh, so uh, eventually, they not only had, the, they, they went beyond the 26 uh, words in the base alphabet and started and eventually had between 75 and 100 Cherokee words that they used uh, for spelling. For uh, aircraft, they used bird names. And uh, for the generic word for airplane was uh, to use an alien, uh, a boat that flies, or a Nancy Schwab. They were birds. And, uh, and there were a lot of planes they had to identify, bombers, fighters, uh, Japanese zeros, and I, I think, I, I, I have a vague recollection that Zishuoko was a, a Japanese zero, uh, Ramen. But, uh, but one phrase that he gave me when they were under attack by, by kamikazes, that the guy that he was talking to on another ship, whose name was Sudo on a stick, or walking stick, um, when, when they were being attacked, he uh, radioed, Tina Kamikishi, let me kill the lice that let me kill the lice for you. Uh, so in that sense, Tina or lice uh, was the word that was used to refer to the uh, Kapikazis. But in the time that I was there, I recorded uh, 101 bird names in Cherokee. I don't know how many they used. I know the Wolohili, or eagle, was used for a heavy bomber. And a Japanese plane of the same type was called Shuli Apo, or Great Buzzard. Um, but a lot of the attack planes were uh, 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 carry on birds, or hawks. Uh, they used a lot of hawk names and attack birds uh, to describe the planes. And the uh, so that's 101 possibilities that they could apply to the various planes that they were describing. And these are the Japanese fighters that they encountered in World War II. Now, um, I, I, sh I should point out that the, the man that uh, Scar talked about most as being 
uh, a co-talker, was someone he identified only as walking sick, who don't want to speak. And I asked uh, his daughter, which walking stick was it? Because among the 335 Eastern Cherokees who served in the war, there were seven walking sticks. And I, I thought at first it might be Ramsey walking stick, who was the father of the three children that the Crows adopted. And, uh, and he was in the Navy, but did not enlist until early 1945. But these dates don't line up. But she suggested uh, several others. And, uh, and one of the people that she suggested, I called his daughter, and his daughter uh, said, no, I don't think it was dad, because when he ran for council, he had to have mom translate for him because he didn't speak the Cherokee well enough. And her mom was from Stillwell, Oklahoma, and so, um, uh, and her name, her big name was Livers, uh, Euro Livers. But uh, this woman gave me five or eight, gave me eight other walking sticks who might be possibilities. And in going through all the service records, I, I believe that the person that Scar was talking to was demanding a walking stick. And I never met him in the 1970s because he married a woman in Oklahoma, moved here, and died in Oklahoma in 1996. Um, I really uh, talked about World War I, and, and I want to go back to this just for a second because I think there was a real opportunity missed with Cherokee co talkers in World War II. In World War I, there were 12,000 American Indians who served in the war, and many of those uh, individuals spoke uh, their own language. This is the 30th Infantry Division in August of 1918. And this was the division that the Eastern Cherokees were in. They were in the 119th and 120th regiments. This division was made up of soldiers from North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and Tennessee. And virtually all of the Cherokees were in two regiments in the 119th and 120th. And um, uh, when I was talking with uh, Jerry Wolf at the Museum of Cherokee yesterday, uh, the Don Arnage, who, uh, who scanned his photo, uh, told me that she had a lot of uh, photos in her family's albums and would send those to me with the help. And I said, sure, send me what you got. So for the next hour and a half, I kept getting these photographs, and she was sending uh, uh, to me from North Carolina. And this is one of her relatives, uh, George Al, who was in the 30th uh, infantry. I don't know if he was a co-talker, I do know that he was a charity speaker, and most likely uh, one of the people uh, that was in the unit. This is another one of her relatives, uh, Lulu, a woman who was an Army field nurse uh, with the 30th Division. And of course, the, the Choctaws get uh, most of the credit that the Cherokees were actually the first co-talkers in World War I. They began operating in late September uh, 1918 at the Battle of the The Choctaws did not, were not brought into service until October of 1918 in the same battle. Now, Adolf Hitler uh, was on the front lines in World War I. This is him in the lower left. And he knew about Cherokee and Choctaw food talkers. And in preparation for World War II, he sent students or and scholars to the United States to study American Indian languages. But this wasn't, <coughs> and, and what's surprising is that the United States wasn't doing the same thing, it wasn't developing co-talkers in the 20s and 30s, knowing at least by the mid 30s that war was inevitable. But this is a letter dated 1942 Talk, and, and this is uh, uh, talking about, I don't, know, I don't think I can adjust this, but let me see if it has the pertinent information on here. Um, uh, under number three, it says Mr. Johnson stated that the Navajo is the only tribe in the United States that has not been infested with German students during the past 20 years. 
these Germans studying various tribal dialects under the guise of art students, anthropologists, etc., have undoubtedly attained a good working knowledge of all tribal dialects except Navajo. For this reason, the Navajo is the only tribe available offering complete security for the type of work under consideration. Um, and it says that uh, they could recruit a thousand Navajos for that purpose. Well, they ended up recruiting about 420, or about 420 Navajos that served in the United States Marine Corps of the Pacific during the war as co uh, The United States Army recruited uh, Comanches, and according to uh, one of the co they were trying to get 40. They settled for 20, and then ended up with 17, and then just before D-Day, Three of those were sent home because they had dependents. But there were uh, 14 Comanche co talkers who took part in the invasion of Normandy uh, in 1944. And uh, this is another army uh, message that says, therefore, it's recommended an effort be made to enlist 200 Navajo Indians for this force. In addition to linguistic qualifications in English, their tribal dialect. Cherokee, and he uh, admitted that he did not, but he said that, that was 
the one time that he wished that he could have answered yes. These are Comanche helicopters at Fort Benning, Georgia, uh, prior to the D-Day invasion. And this is the last surviving uh, helicopter, Charles Chibidi, uh, and he died in Tulsa on July 20th, 2005. And uh, that's a Comanche helicopter boat. And, uh, and Scar told me that they never wrote anything down, even when they did the radio transmissions. Everything was transcribed in English. They never wrote anything in Cherokee. But if they had to spell something, uh, he, would, uh, uh, he, he would tell the person he was talking to that he was getting ready to uh, 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 write it. I think he said, Ayaga Oilokan, which is uh, an idiom that's imperative. Let me write it, or I just wrote it. And I would spell it out uh, in Cherokee. Now, in 1972, I attended uh, the uh, Summer Institute uh, for, for American Linguistics in Chapelville, North Carolina. And there was a Japanese linguist named Nobuyuki Honda who was very interested in Cherokee. And I took him and uh, his uh, friend. Geeka Tanaka to Cherokee, North Carolina to meet uh, some Cherokees. And Scar was very uh, cordial, uh, but, uh, but at the same, same time somewhat uneasy about uh, Japanese scholars being, wanting to know more about Cherokee. And Nobu Yuki told me that he had been working with uh, Imperial cryptographers from World War II. They had heard messages they couldn't decipher. They had, dis they had deciphered uh, alphabetical codes that the Americans were using and did those fairly readily. And I, I should point out that the Americans cracked all of the Japanese codes that were used during the war, uh, in some cases long before the war began. But the, the code that they're using uh, before the attack of Pearl Harbor, unfortunately, was only about 10% deciphered uh, when those messages took place. But uh, I tried to get in touch with him this past week, knowing I was going to do this presentation, and I uh, found three email addresses for him. None of them worked. But I did locate uh, his friend, uh, who's now uh, at a, the head of a research institution in Florida. And she said, well, I don't know if he, he speaks English anymore. But, uh, and at the time I went, she couldn't put three words of English together. Uh, but was, but has been here for almost 50 years and now can. But he sent me this very nice email this week. Uh, and he says that in 1977 and 78, uh, that uh, he could talk to some people in a Japanese signal for him. And he says that uh, uh, among the people in this group was an anthropologist. And they heard a language being transmitted between the ships of the American fleet. And they didn't recognize it. They had no idea what it was. But the anthropologist uh, suggested maybe it's an American Indian language. As far as I know, Cherokee is the only language used in the Pacific fleet at that time. So if they were listening to a what he calls a strange language, the language they were listening to was Cherokee. But um, obviously they were not able to uh, decipher it or, or tell what it was. But I, I can't help but wonder if the reason why the USS Louisville was targeted, because there were lots of American ships, but there were only uh, 16 kamikazes that attacked them if they attacked that ship because they realized there was something important about that ship because of the high security of codes that they were using and they, and they were listening to the code that they did not decide. So, um, unfortunately, in, in retrospect, uh, in the early 1970s, Charles Crow was going to share with me everything he knew about code languages, how it worked, 
maturity is the code language. And, um, but he also, at the time, asked me not to share it in a way that would preclude charity from ever being used as code language again. And, um, um, and I don't know if there is a, well, I don't know if it ever will be, but I, I think as far as a code language, Cherokee is probably one of the best languages to use as a code language simply because it's so complex and so difficult to, uh, for any non-speakers to do anything with. And what I, I, I fail to understand, and I really never thought about it until I was preparing for this presentation, why with 335 Eastern Cherokees in service in World War II, and with it, at least a hundred of those, at least a third of that group, being fluent in the Cherokee language, why weren't those guys brought together to uh, serve uh, American security interests the same way the Navajos were? And I can't help but think countless lives would have been saved if the American government had did the same thing that Adolf Hitler had done in the 20s and 30s, and then as the same scholar, the students, and uh, linguist in to study American Indian languages in anticipation of those languages being used in the war effort. But I don't think that was, that, in spite of whatever the Germans did, I don't think it provided any meaningful, meaningful help for them during the war. And I can't help but think that the Cherokees, both in North Carolina, where there was a hundred and a large, much larger number in Oklahoma who spoke Cherokee, who could have served in this capacity. Why the U.S. government did not utilize this resource that was sitting right there and didn't recognize and didn't recognize it until long after the war. So, uh, about, I, I should say, Joletta Pro Scar's daughter said that her father told her that because Cherokee was a written language, he carried his testament somewhere with him, that there was always the fear that the Japanese might be able to do something with written charity. I don't think they could have, even if they had the, the, the text. But uh, nonetheless, there was uh, a fear that they had during the war. And, and that may be one of the reasons why they went to such lengths to turn Cherokee's code language into a mostly original language so that uh, terms that would not be recognized by uh, an average speaker could be used in sending codes between ships in the Pacific Fleet. Yes. Is there enough 
difference between the eastern man's dialect and Oklahoma dialect? Uh, if you had Cherokees from two, you know, both places, they wouldn't be able to communicate very well. Um, I, I'm not sure how best to describe it. Uh, it's probably no greater than British English and American English. In North Carolina, the vowels are higher, and there are a couple of sounds in the Oklahoma dialect that don't occur in North Carolina. T L D L are replaced by T S D S sound. So, and then S medial in North Carolina is S wedge and, and uh, S at the beginning as well. So. Way uh, shun uh, is cat in North Carolina. Way sun is cat in Oklahoma. And, uh, and I remember Scott saying that when they were using minimal pairs to try to confuse the Japanese if they were getting close, um, one of the minimal, minimal pairs he gave me was shun king, mink, and shun king, onion. So uh, onion was for O. Shunky mink was for him when they were spelling out words. But they would use words that were close together uh, because they didn't think that Japanese could distinguish between voices and voices of stars. Uh, and then that became the Yes, ma'am. You had a And the Navajo is the same thing. And, and what I'm thinking is that 
the, the Cherokee cryptographers because they use some of the same forms in their own language that Comanches and Navajos did, that there must have been some coordination between the three. But, but they each were, used the word for terrapin or pain as terrapin or tortoise.